And greetings from iconic New York being presented by CNBC and Inc.com. We have a, a lot more coming up this afternoon in the rundown, as you just heard. But uh, let's talk about what's happening here. And we have hundreds joining us today right here in Midtown New York. A lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of budding entrepreneurs seeking advice and also with a, a lot of innovative pitches as well. And one of our familiar faces on CNBC, on our power pitch now joins us, Alicia Siret. Good to see you. It's great to see you too. Now, you know, you're in the business of finding companies, right. of uh, identifying successful companies mm -hmm. in the future. So, you know, what goes into a successful pitch? Well, first of all, I think the person has to be really prepared, although they shouldn't come across as being too memorized. And you just have to know all the main points that you want to convey to the investor, whether it's exactly what you do and the company, and the, the focus on the market size and competitive advantage and what your fundraising needs are and being able to say it in a very succinct way in like a minute. Now, if someone wants to learn more, then you can you know, go through all the details, but that's it. You really have to have your elevator pitch ready. Right. Do people actually get a minute these days? Yeah, I think they do. I thought it was 30 seconds. <laughs> no, I think a minute's fine, and then you can expand upon that. Okay, so how about here so far at Iconic New York? Have you heard any great pitches so far? Well, you know what's funny is that it was less so the pitches and more people just asking for strategic advice. So I came into it thinking that it was all going to be pitch feedback, but it really wasn't. For the people who did ask for pitch feedback, it really was a matter of breaking it down to like seven or eight sentences that fit in that minute time frame and helping them think through structurally all the aspects of the business that we should be talking about. Let's talk about that. Seven okay. to eight sentences. Seven to eight sentences. What do I need to include in those seven to eight sentences? Well, some of the big things are exactly what your company does, yeah. who you are, you know, who's behind it, your team, what your competitive advantage is, what your market size is, who your customer is, how you're reaching them, again, what your funding needs are, any kind of major tractions for the business, where the money's going to if you raise it, but that's pretty much it. Those are some of the big things. And if you can fit that in in you know, 45 seconds, you might have another sentence or two you can throw in about a personal pain point or right. something funny, but that's, you know, those are the main things. Well, Alicia, you know that they say the communication, 90% of it is nonverbal. Yes. So yes. in, in this case, if I'm an entrepreneur trying to make this pitch, you know, how do I communicate non-verbally? Well, I think that you can't be too nervous, and that's where the practice comes in. So you hopefully have done the pitch a uh, you know, hundred times at home. So by the time you're actually presenting to someone, you know your stuff, you have that confidence. So don't be too nervous. Also, be comfortable with your own skin, smile, you know, try to make a connection. If you feel like you're pitching to someone and they're just like so distant from you and you can't relate to them, they'll feel that too. Mm -hmm. So you've got to just practice like that connection and making sure that you're not doing anything that's like socially awkward or <laughs> <laughs> no we would never do that especially not on television of course not um, well, what about appearance I mean do you need to to match the industry you're selling to well, it depends. I think that you really need to do whatever plays well to the investor. So if the investor is more institutionalized, they may appreciate it if you're wearing a suit or you're wearing something that's more professional dress. But if you're in the tech sector and the venture capitalist is wearing, you know, jeans and a t-shirt, then maybe it's not so good to dress up and put a suit on um, so that they might find that off-putting. Right. You really have to tailor it to the type of conference, the event, and the person. Right, right, exactly. If you're in fashion, you probably want to, you know, stand out a little bit more. Now, speaking of being more unique. Is, yeah. is there an element in my pitch that I guess should make it memorable for the person I'm pitching to? Well, I think one of the biggest memorable areas is the traction of the business, right? So if you can clearly articulate, I've, you know, generated this much in revenues, or I have the, these major clients, or I, I have these huge partnerships, or I've filed for and achieved these patents, those are some of the biggest things that attract investors' attention right. because it de-risks their investment. So I would say lead with, you know, put your best foot forward with all the major traction points. Okay, lead with your best traction points. Yes, so exactly. numbers, revenue, money making. Any of those big things. It could be user growth, it could be any kind of distribution relationships, whatever that big differentiator is on the progress, that's something that they care about. Okay, now I'm just gonna throw this in here because, okay, okay some people say, name dropping, talking bigger than you are, faking it till you make it. We talked right. to Swell's founder, okay. Sarah Cross today, and she, that was one of the mantras that when she was young in her startup, 
you fake it till you make it. Right. I mean, look, I think that that's true to some extent. You have to be confident as an entrepreneur. And so there is a little bit, bit of that in there. You know, you, you've got to put yourself out there and you're going to get a lot of rejections. But with that said, there's a fine line. If you're too salesy, if you're promising something that you can't deliver on, or if people find out that there's more smoke than substance, then it'll come back to bite you. So you do have to be careful about that. Okay. Yeah, you do have to be careful about that. What about cold calling? Like, do you pick up the phone and just call somebody out of the blue? I mean, look, you can, but I'd highly recommend getting a warm introduction whenever possible. And the truth is, is if someone you know makes that introduction, the person on the receiving end has an even higher obligation to make sure that they make a good impression on you, and that's what you ideally want in any meeting. Okay, that, okay so that's what you should do. You should get an introduction first. If you can. First. <laughs> yes, if you, if you can, can't. Then cold email. Okay. But yes, if you can possibly get the warm intro, go for that first. Okay, go for the warm intro first. Now, in all your years, what, what has been, I guess, the, some of the pitches that have stood out to you? Can you point to one, give us an example uh, of what you consider a successful pitch? Well, I think it's when you really want to learn more about the person, where you feel like their passion is contagious. Yeah. They seem really sharp. They seem to know all the answers to the questions that are thrown at them. Yeah. And at the same time, they seem like someone you'd want to work with. Right. You know, some of the investments I make, I may be tied to the company for 10 plus years. <laughs> so I want to like the person too. I want to know it's a good business opportunity. So it's that feeling that they really know their stuff and they're in, they're doing something very interesting, but then I also like them. Right. And I want to work with them more too. <laughs> That's kind of what Mark Zuckerberg says, right? Probably yeah. It's fair. It's, I think it's a fair assessment. So any companies you can point to where you said, okay, this like an example from your professional life that you can share with us? So where I really like the entrepreneur? Yeah, you, yeah the company. Yeah, the company. sure. Well, there's um, there are a couple examples I can think of. There's a guy named Noah Densel who runs Nomad, and I actually invested in his company. And he is just such a sharp guy and super motivated and always innovating. It's a consumer hardware company. And then there's another woman, Diana Lovett from CSA Trading Co. It's Fair Trade Cocoa Products. She was a Fulbright scholar who then went on to uh, study at Cambridge and Yale. And um, she's just so motivated by what she does. And there's a social mission behind it. So both of those are, are individuals who have built great companies. But I also just really like them. And I believe in what they're doing. That's Okay, well, of course you have to. You if you're going to put money behind you it. You have to. Um, can I just also ask you about sure. the dollar amounts uh, that should be included in your pitch? I mean, how do you know what to ask for, if that right. makes sense? Well, look, I think that it depends on where your company is, the stage of growth, and what's considered normal in the industry. A lot of companies that when they first raise from friends and family, that may be checks as little as like 20000 or maybe in aggregate it's 100000 By the time you get to an angel network, yeah. these rounds are anywhere from like 250 k 500 k upwards of $1 or $2 million. Right. So depending on where your company is and who you're pitching, you have to kind of go within that framework. Right. By the time you get to VCs, you may be trying to raise multiple multiple millions of dollars. It right. could be five million checks, 10 million checks. So really knowing your growth stage of your company and then who you're targeting, that should determine how you position your raise. All right. Well, this has been very informative. Thank, Thank you. you for having Thank me. you. Alicia Surratt there, very informative. Now, you know, one, um, I guess one avenue, one industry that we talked about here at Iconic today, and it was surprisingly how interesting it was and how relevant it was, is cybersecurity. And we caught up with David Kennedy, who's the founder and CEO of Trust the Second, also Binary Defense. Breaking into stuff is easy, right? Because you know, there's so much information out there for us, um, it's, it's possible for us to essentially do anything. Physical security by far is the easiest for us. We just impersonate anybody you want to. What's best is if you dress in a suit, put on your phone, and you act like you're busy. Walk into any building you want to, including some of the most secure places. Uh, I've actually, I won't even talk about that one, actually. Uh, so we'll tell you. <laughs> some fun tricks. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's one, one second here. Hopefully it plays, come on. There we go. So I gotta find where the mouse is at. I'm, I can hack into computer systems, but apparently I can't uh, play a video. <laughs> All right, hang on a second. I'll fix this. All right, so just look up here really quick. I'll hit play. So in these cases, um, doors have sensors. And in sensors, uh, when, you, when you open up a door building that's locked, you can actually use e-cigarettes to trigger the motion sensors on the other side to open up the doors for you. I don't smoke, by the way, but I always carry an e-cigarette with me uh, just to make sure. It's actually in my bag right now. I broke into like three places when I was coming here. But. 
So you open up a door that way, right? <laughs> so you ever need to get into a bank? I was actually a funny story. Uh, I was breaking into a bank. <laughs> And uh, um, I've been wanting to do this e-cigarette trick for, for such a long time. I've been like, like it's going to work, it's going to work. I've tested it out. This is where I tested it out on. Uh, this is at a hotel. Um, and so I'm like, all right, I'm going to test it out. So I go to this bank, and it's like 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm like in all black. You know, I got throat mics. We're communicating with my other guy. You know, we're breaking into this bank building. And our whole goal is to get to this vault and get to the vault and then, you know, break into the vault and then take the money out, take pictures, and then put the money back, unfortunately. Um, but we got into this bank, and we're at the front door. And I'm sitting there for like five minutes blowing smoke into this, this, this door trying to trigger this motion sensor to work. We had already disabled the security system, actually did this time. Um, and one of my other folks, um, uh, Ben, which is right there, he, he's actually like 37, looks like he's like 14. Um, <laughs> but uh, Ben was, was, was going around the building to see if there's any other, other ways into there. So I'm out there for like 10 minutes now at this point, blowing smoke in this. I finally get it to work and I'm so excited. And I walk in and Ben's sitting there on the counter like <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> And I'm like, Ben, how did you get in? Did you use the, the, the cigarette trick somewhere else? And he's like, no, nah, man, the side door was open. They forgot to lock it. I'm like, all right. Uh, if you ever need to get into a bank with whiskey, this is my good buddy, Deviant. Got motion sensors on the top. Or you can just dress up in suits and, and pretend that it's someone's birthday. That's Biebs. Looks like Justin Bieber. And then this is us actually walking into the building. And walking past. While they're doing the balloons, we walk right into the building, and then we plug into the network, and we hack and steal all our data. So physicals can definitely be um, pretty easy. But there is some good news in all of this, OK? There is good news. The good news is there's a whole class of us out there, hackers. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. I'm using uh, uh, someone else's computer, and uh, I want to hit the up arrow. It takes like 30 seconds to respond. So, uh, um, but uh, the good news is there's a whole class of hackers out there that are designed to try to figure out what's happening in the industry and try to protect folks. Everything from when you saw the WannaCry stuff happen. When, when WannaCry was happening, does everybody know how that got stopped and why it wasn't so catastrophic as we thought it was going to be? website was not registered, so one guy bought the website. Yep. The a 22-year-old kid out of the UK was trying to help, 22 years old, was trying to help, and he was taking a look at the malware and saw that when, when it was launching, it was going out to a website that, that wasn't registered. And it was an accident. He, he registered the domain name trying to figure out the website to see how many people were getting inf infected by WannaCry. And what the hackers had actually done is built in protection mechanisms against security defenses. And it said, if this website is up, shut yourself down because we think we're inside of what's called a sandbox, something that, that is looking for us to see if we're bad or not. And so it was a way of defeating um, the security techniques that we use today. But this 22-year-old registered this domain name. And so what happened is when the virus called out to say, hey, are you up and running? Is this website up and running? Am I inside of a sandbox? It's like, yep, the website's up and running. It actually stopped catastrophic loss across the world. And literally here in the United States, he found it just before we went into work here in the United States. So there's a whole group of us dedicated out there trying to protect folks against these types of things that are happening. And believe me, when, when WannaCry happened, it was on a Thursday night, of course. I didn't sleep all of Friday. I happened to go on a, another news organization at like, like 5 o'clock in the morning. I hadn't slept for two days, so I had like bags underneath my eyes. And you know, I had the, the suit on, but I was wearing gym shorts. Um, and I did the Charles Barkley. Uh, that's how it works. Um, but those types of things are things that we're trying to, to defend against. There's a whole group of us out there for it. Here's something that I did on over 20,000 hackers in one. Here's place. something I did on on uh, Defcon's the perfect venue for Discovery them to prepare Channel. for an upcoming bank hack in Beirut, Lebanon. So my good friends Jason. I mean, what's up? I thought what's you could up? break into anywhere. You couldn't oh, even get in our own oh, door. Screw you, man. <laughs> screw you. The beauty of this community is that I don't know all this in this one field, but I've got a friend who does. So what do you need? What do you want? We got, so we're doing a bank job, and uh, we're going all the way, like, so we're going to do the full penetration testing, yeah. everything, and full social engineering. Well, good news is I have uh, an unpublished version of the social engineering toolkit uh, where I just rewrote um, all the PowerShell injection techniques. I 
I had a new one uh, I did recently with it. So security guards, um, you know, have their phones next to them. Right. So I spoofed a text message to the security guard, letting him know that there was an issue outside. He went outside, and then I broke into the building that way. So it works really well. Yeah, so write that great. down. Yeah. <laughs> that is sweet and scary. What's up, dude? Dude. Of all the hackers here, few know tech better than Darren Kitchen. We know you have some new stuff right. that's coming out. So He's patented one of the most potent devices now in use and brought several that aren't even on the market yet. So if you need to do any uh, wireless on this engagement, this guy, Pineapple. So it's on right now. My phone's connected to it. Check this out. So someone's already Turn off, getting... turn off your Wi-Fi. <laughs> Everybody turn off, turn off, turn off everything now. Everybody turn off anything, you guys. But yeah, check this out. So we've got basically everyone in the vicinity. Oh my gosh. Right? So basically, man, this is a, a malicious access point. Think right. about it from this factor. You know, people go to Starbucks all the time. They go right. to hotels. Right. When they join those networks, your computer records those settings. So right. next time you power your computer on, it's like, hey, is Starbucks here? Hey, is this hotel here? And that intercepts that and says, yep, always, I'm yep, Starbucks, me. connect to me. So if I was a bad guy, I could actually uh, manipulate the, the websites they go to. Yeah. Now you're the man in the middle. So I can create a fake web page that looks like Facebook, or it'll look like uh, the homepage for Google or Gmail. It'll look like the homepage for several banks and make you put in your user ID and password there, and you think you're going to the legitimate site. Yeah, but they don't even realize it. So we're, yeah, we're definitely going to use that. Yeah. So you guys going to get physical access to any of these machines? We're planning, well, if, even if you only have a few seconds, I brought you some ducky payload. So what's nice about this one uh, specifically is uh, um, if you actually watch the whole show, um, we, we basically armed Jason uh, with enough stuff and Khalil, good buddies of mine, um, and they went to Lebanon, which is where Khalil's from, and they broke into a bank. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a great show if you, if you didn't have a chance to see it, but uh, they've literally broken into this bank. Uh, we're like, you know, uh, taking people from their computers, like the tellers, and saying, excuse me, I'm just here, I, I gotta uh, update your software, and this basically plugs in a USB device that hacks your computer um, from someone just off of the streets, um, and got into their uh, financial systems and were able to take control of those uh, full things. Um, so obviously, um, there's a group of us trying to figure out how to best secure and, and exp explain vulnerabilities to companies and provide more uh, awareness because it usually is the humans uh, that become our weakest link for it. And so when you look at technology and what we're dealing with, businesses, if you're conducting any type of, of, of business online with technology, security has to be part of that plan. It has to be designed in a way that allows your business to be a, essentially compartmentalized in different areas so that if one of your areas of exposure get, gets compromised, it doesn't impact the rest of your business. And so if you look at building that, it's what we call in the security industry the defense in depth strategy, um, something that, that focuses on multiple layers of security to try to protect yourselves uh, from when these types of things happen. And it's not something that, that's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. These things are legitimately happening uh, all over the place. I came from uh, the intelligence community. I can tell you that uh, uh, when it comes to what we're facing as a nation, uh, we are in direct peer competitors with, with a number of different countries, uh, including Russia, including China, including North Korea. Uh, North Korea to lesser extent, they're not as good as us. Um, Iran uh, as well. Uh, and we have a number of adversaries that are actively looking at stealing intellectual property. They're actively looking at getting into our water treatment facilities. And by the way, everybody always, always makes the argument, well, why haven't we seen a catastrophic loss in certain locations before? And it's because we all hack each other and we all don't want to turn each other's systems off. So we, we hack Russia's water treatment facilities, their electric grid. They hack our water treatment facilities and our electric grid. And we all know we, we have access to each other. And we're like, well, we don't want to shut each other off because it impacts both of us. So it's kind of an arms race at this point on when the next thing happens around the types of capabilities that we're seeing out there. Um, and so hopefully, you know, it, it goes to a peaceful uh, type of thing. But we're all hacking each other uh, right now when it comes to it. Um, so that's the interesting part. If you're doing business, must focus on, on security as a day-to-day -day thing. And you know, as an industry, uh, we're growing. Uh, you know, I mentioned that, that hacker conference in, in Black Hat and uh, DEF CON in Vegas. That's been going on. When I started in, in the industry uh, in 2003, I was working for the military, and there was maybe 100 of us at this, this convention in Vegas. You know, it was a small group of hackers, a bunch of computer nerds. Um, literally, we looked like we're in, in our mom's basements. Um, you know, uh, and 100 of us at this pool at a, a place called Lexus Park. And now it's taken over Caesars, where we can't even fit any more people into the place because it's grown so big as an industry. So we have 20,000 plus hackers converging on Vegas once a year to share how we're collectively trying to uh, face what we're dealing with uh, out there today. Um, and there's all, also conferences literally happening every single day. I was at a security conference yesterday. I was working with some of the largest businesses here in New York City, um, helping them defend um, themselves against what's happening out there. We have a, a practice called hunt teaming going on and looking for hackers in your environments. 
And so those are the things that we're doing as an industry to try to get better, and people um, in this industry are really focusing hard on it. But it requires help. We need more folks. Uh, you know, uh, it's a great field. It's a growing field. It's something that, you know, I started my business uh, five years ago, and I have well over 200 employees uh, across the nation. Um, and I get to work with some of the largest companies you can possibly imagine because we're in so demand. Um, and that's one of the cool things about what we're dealing with is that it's not going to stop anytime soon and technology is going to get better. We have to do something about it to protect our future. Okay, so we're going to segue to cybersecurity here at Iconic New York. And joining us now, we have David Kennedy, founder, CEO of Trustasec and Binary Defense. Thank you very much for having me on here. It's been a wonderful event. Good to see you. Yeah. I heard you were hilarious, and that's hard to find in the cybersecurity field. It is. There's not a lot of uh, folks that are personable and can hack into computer systems all day long. It's not the, the most exciting job, but uh, you know, we, we have some, some of us have social capabilities as well. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I heard your performance was, uh, was really engaging. Um, so well, let's talk about cybersecurity. I, it sounds so serious. What is happening right now in the world? You know, uh, we use technology in everything that we do. I mean, everything from implantable devices, you know, to pacemakers, uh, to what we wear on our phones, to, you know, the, the Internet of Things where we have, you know, uh, Nest thermostats and, you know, camera systems and even embedded in our cars. So technology is, is part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's not going to slow down anytime soon. And so with that comes security exposures, and, and hackers take advantage of it. Uh, we've seen a lot of boom in what we call ransomware attacks. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had the whole WannaCry scare, uh, where they shut down hospitals and other locations. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big pandemic right now, and hackers, both on organized crime, are making substantial amounts of money. I mean, you're talking billions and billions of dollars. This is a full-fledged industry, um, and taking advantage of companies and computer systems and having them pay for their systems, as well as uh, what we see from nation states. You know, Russia has been very active around the voting, obviously the voting issues with the DNC, uh, and what we see as far as attacking the United States, we're hacking each other all the time right now, and it's, it's a big pandemic across the entire world that we're seeing. And so, so you saw an opportunity to keep us safe on the internet. That's right. You know, I, I started off my career uh, on the military intelligence side uh, and focusing more on the cyber warfare capability pieces of it. And uh, I was uh, everything from a chief security officer to from from Diebold, uh, who makes the ATM machines, all the way to when I started, uh, you know, trusted second binary defense in my basement five years ago. Now we're a global company, you know, across the entire you know, you know entire world, uh, trying to stop hackers at what they do and help protect businesses and, and what they're actually going for. Okay, so it's not just hackers and basements. People that protect us on the internet also work in basements as well. That's absolutely right. And, and we're not all in basements. Uh, you know, surprisingly, we don't have hoodies and we don't hack in hoodies. Uh, you know, there's a, a whole series of, of hackers that are out there that are good that fight for trying to protect the world against what's happening out there in technology and really trying to protect the risks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that is a, a desired skill. And, and it's, it's great because you have kids coming up with technology nowadays and they're just so fast at learning it um, that they naturally progress into security. And so we have a lot of really young folks. You know, it's a real you know, fun environment, Nerf guns and, you know, arcade games and things like that. Right. Um, but at the same time, we're doing a really important mission at trying to protect the world uh, and what's happening out there as far as hackers breaking into computer systems and stealing data. That's right. So I think you're our first cybersecurity guest today for cybersecurity entrepreneur in this day and age when you're trying to protect yourself and you know your private information your credit card information I would imagine there's a huge need for a company like yours there is you know uh, and what people can uh, uh, hopefully understand is that the, the main reason why we're seeing these breaches today is because of us as humans. Humans are the number one target when it comes to all these breaches that you see in the news when someone's stealing a credit card information. It usually um, comes down to one person opening up an email and clicking on a link that ends up hacking their computer and it becomes the downfall of an entire company. And so with that, you know, um, humans being the weakest link, it, uh, you know, we're very busy at trying to help companies uh, educate their users, um, help them b build you know, security defenses to help them protect against those. So we're, we're in high demand right now uh, and we're hiring like crazy uh, and we continue to grow because this is something that's not going to slow down anytime soon. So why did you decide to start your own company? You know, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I was a, a, a chief security officer, one of the youngest VPs uh, in Diebold history, uh, and I had a, a great job. Um, you know, I didn't have to worry about a thing, um, but I, did, I felt like I wasn't uh, doing my part to help and fix uh, what's out there in security. And so I, I really, you know, it was, it was a perfect timing too. My wife uh, was pregnant with twins, um, and I decided right now is the best time to go and start my own company uh, in the basement of my house, uh, you know, no funding or anything like that, and, uh, and decided to leave and, and uh, try to help the world and, and protect themselves. And, uh, you know, we've, I've surrounded myself with, with uh, like-minded individuals. We have a whole team dedicated to um, trying to protect uh, the, uh, the country. And when WannaCry was happening, we were all up until, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning taking apart how it's working, trying to stop it, trying to combat it, get the information out there uh, to try to protect the world on when we saw, you know, hospitals being shut down. So that's what we're here for. Okay, so when you're starting off a, a company like in cybersecurity, do you need to raise a lot of capital? Pro I would imagine not as much as other more capital intensive industries. 
Yeah, you know, the, the first company I started was Trusted Second. Consulting's, uh, you know, relatively easy. Not a lot of capital you need up front. Um, you know, you, it's, def, it's the person that they're buying at that point in time. So, you know, you have general costs like server infrastructures and, you know, IT stuff and things like that. Uh, marketing, legal, you know, some minor things, but not a, a ton of capital you need up front. Uh, where the capital comes into play is uh, we have a, a second company I started, and I did it in, in phases. Um, you know, Trusted Sec was first to get the capital I needed to be able to start my second company, uh, Binary Defense, and that requires a lot more because we have a 24/7 security operations center. We have hackers monitoring, you know, uh, other, you know, for other hackers breaking into our computer systems all the time. And we have software developers writing software and code to try to protect against hackers to protect our customers. So that requires a lot more substantial investment, uh, you know, initially up front and as we go along. But uh, what's been nice is that. Uh, you know, first year starting Trusted Tech, profitable company. First year starting Binary Defense, profitable Profitable company. in the first year? Profitable the first year. Profitable first year. And, and then the second company, after all the investments that I put into it, profitable second year. So we were profitable uh, in both companies the very first times. And I actually uh, also started a, a conference called DerbyCon, uh, which is now the second largest hacker conference in the country. So wow. all profitable uh, business ventures and things that uh, are help, uh, you know, helping the community and helping the, the, the world. Wow, okay, well let me ask you this. I assume you've been approached many times for yeah. someone to buy the company. Um, do you feel like it's time to sell yet? You know, uh, I don't get, in, uh, I get offers all the time, but it's not, I, I really enjoy what I'm doing right now and I love every minute of it. I wake up, you know, going to work, you know, uh, singing to Justin Timberlake and, you know, in the world's, you know, uh, uh, flowers and everything. Uh, it's, it's a great time for me. So I, I'm not interested in selling. Maybe that happens down, down the road someday. Right. Uh, but right now, you know, we're making a huge impact on the industry. We're, we're kicking butt and taking names uh, and that's what we want to continue to go and do. Okay, so what are people asking you here at Iconic? You know, uh, you know, the the presentation was really neat because um, I was trying to show what happens out there um, in the real world, and I actually called somebody up on stage that I never met before, um, and I hacked into her personal information. I got her social security number, I got her uh, date of birth, her age, I got all of her family members, uh, their their driver's licenses, their locations. I got everything about them that you would you know consider. And I did it in about thirty seconds. Um, so I wanted to show what was actually possible. That's so out there. scary. That is so scary. Okay. It is. Yeah. You know, but we put all of our information online, so you know it's easy to find that stuff for us as hackers. Um, for me, it's all about education around what's possible and what you can do to protect yourself, not just in business, but personally, um, things that you can do to protect yourself. And that's the most important message here, I think, at Iconic is, is to, to say, okay, we can do something to stop these hackers. We can do things in our business. And especially for entrepreneurs, small businesses, you know, they typically have much less security um, when it comes to what they're doing because they're, you know, it's, it's low budget trying to get everything off the ground and, and keep things going. You can do it. Uh, you, if you're doing technology in business, you can do it. You can secure yourself. You just need to understand what the, the, the capabilities are of the hackers and how to protect yourself. Okay. Okay, so in 30 seconds, tell me, if I am a small business owner, I want to protect my business and my clients' information, yep. what is the cheapest, most efficient way to do that? You can go to a lot of uh, cloud providers that provide security uh, in, in the actual process itself. Um, you know, things that, that are like, uh, um, when you go to encrypt things, it's already automatically encrypted. Uh, there, there's, there's providers that tout security uh, as part of it. So cloud can help you a lot when you don't have the um, stability to be able to build it in-house. If you're building in-house, you want to protect it. You want to um, have your, your um, computer systems designed to be in layers. So if one person gets hacked, it doesn't you know, um, cause the entire company to get hacked. So keeping information separate from different uh, roles within the company is very important. But most importantly, let's just stop clicking on things. You know, if you don't know where an email comes from, don't open it up. You don't need to look at it. You know, your Amazon package didn't get rerouted. Um, um, you know, there isn't a Nigerian prince, you know, that, that uh, wants to, you know, gift you a million dollars. Those are the things that we need to be careful of. So stop clicking on things is the biggest thing I could ever uh, emphasize to people in stopping these types of attacks because that's how they happen. Okay. Yeah. Well, David, you've been informative and scary at the same time. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate it. And a wonderful event. Iconic has been wonderful. <laughs> uh, great group here. So thanks. Yeah. Great, great to have you. Thank thanks. you again. David Kennedy, it. Trusted Sec. Okay. That was cybersecurity expert to David Kennedy. Yep, cybersecurity expert there, David Kennedy. So, yeah, we are going to take a look, a look now at the unique strategies for building a successful business from an earlier iconic panel that was moderated by CNBC's own John Ford. Tell us about the skills that you brought to this project coming in. You were a CPA, mm -hmm. uh, you had been to Harvard Business School, mm -hmm. and were kind of hunting for an idea mm -hmm. to be entrepreneurial. Uh, your parents? had been small business owners, you sort of grew up in that environment. What was your approach to entrepreneurialism? Did you always know that eventually you were going to be starting your own thing? I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't think I was going to be a water bottle entrepreneur per se, but I, I was always looking for an idea. But I think I 
was looking for such a big idea that that would it, it, I was never going to find it because it, it had to be this big aha moment. I was looking and searching. I never really thought it was going to just find me in in a moment of you know hiking and being thirsty as you know the, the intro happened. So what to you was a big idea? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, a big idea is is is, is Mailchimp, right? Well, what, did, what, what did you? I mean, it doesn't. Seem, but a, none of these seem like big ideas. Yeah. Right? I'm going to send people email for other people. Yeah. I mean, that, right? Yeah. So, what did you mm -hmm. think a big idea was going to be? Mm -hmm. The next Google, the next Facebook? Yeah, exactly. You know, some big platform, some big moment, some big change, change the world moment. I, I don't know that I I thought, you know, coming out of business school, that it could literally be. Uh, taking a product that already exists and making it work better, making it look better. You know, Swell is really fashion function philanthropy. Like we're a product that you know keeps things hot and cold. It has a, as a nicer outside and looks better. It gives back to a charity. It's it's a product that obviously has existed for a long time, mm -hmm. but we've been able to convert the non-converteds. Like we we've been able to have customers actually collect our products because of the the fact that we've got bigger ones that hold a bottle of wine or smaller ones that go in a lunchbox or fashion collaborations it actually has turned into a big idea but i think when i started the company i didn't realize how big the market would be and for, you started for it me. with thirty thousand dollars correct was that thirty thousand dollars you had in a special bank account marked for starting a business or was it there for something else and you had to rate it to start this, when you had that epiphany idea, it was it was all that it was all that I had basically. <laughs> so um, so I had a little bit of stock in in old in an old company and a little bit of savings. I was always very frugal, um, and basically said, you know, if this is something that I believe in, I should put my own my own sweat equity and my own time and money into this company. And that's instead of raising money, I decided to put my own savings into the company. But it was it was pretty much everything that I had at the time. Ben, couldn't you have grown faster? If you had taken other people's money, I mean, there's so many folks out there who say, "Oh, grow on other people's money." Why didn't you do that? It never occurred to me. <laughs> it honestly never freaking occurred to me. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I, excuse my language. Uh, you know, you I, don't have I, to I, ask for excuse for freaking. <laughs> I know you're from Atlanta. I, That's very nice, but uh, you know. <laughs> I, I, I worked at a company, it was a great company, and uh, it, they started a dot-com and it failed. And they offered us jobs. I said, no thank you, this is a kick in the, in the pants that I need. I know that if I don't try to start my own company now, I never will. Hmm. They gave me a severance check. I got three grand. I used that to buy a business license and get started. Uh, but you know, uh, uh, I, I went out and just knocked on doors and got a lot of paying customers to, to float my business the first couple of years. But once the business is a business, that's right. Once yep. you've got customers, yep, yep, people will start offering you money for a piece of it. So even if it didn't occur to you, it probably started occurring to some other people. It did, but it was uh, it was when a competitor went public. That's when some some investors came knocking. Okay. And when it was, was clear that? to me that this is about a uh, 07. Okay. It was clear to me that they just wanted to turn my business into the next company to go public and not allow me to run it the way that I wanted to run it and be authentic. Part of the authenticity of MailChimp is the level of benefits that you give to employees. 6% um, 401k match, I believe, and, and uh, a lot of other it's the, things. The maximum, it's 20% 20, 20 25%, I think. Oh, really? At the end of the year, yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, does that feed into why you wanted to maintain in independence, something about the culture of the company? And what advice would you have for others who are starting companies? Do you, do you bolt on those values later, or is it something that you sort of had from day one when you first started growing? I think everyone, every entrepreneur that I've ever met who started a company, they believe they're going to bring something unique and authentic. No matter what the, if it's a water bottle company, you know you're going to bring something unique to it. Uh, if it's an ice cream parlor, you know there's something unique and authentic you're going to bring to the table. It's after two years when 30% of small businesses fail. It's after five years when 50% of small businesses fail. You, you get that beaten out of you. Uh, but, but really, most entrepreneurs who make it, they're the ones who remember what it was that made them unique and authentic. And you're saying those values are part of that for you? That's right. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, I'm curious about your scaling mm -hmm. because you went from what 10 million to 100 million in sales within a couple of years mm -hmm. um, doing that with an actual physical product that comes in as many different varieties as yours I, I can't imagine how you did that without 
either taking on a lot of investment, which you haven't done, or a ton of debt. Mm -hmm. How? How? I mean, you're a CPA, so I'm sure that helped, but how did you manage to do that? It has been really helpful that I'm close to my numbers, that I really have to understand the ins and outs of the numbers. Um, it, it also has been an incredible ride of growth. Um, we have had some out of stock situations. Uh -huh. um, we've also had been really careful about inventory planning because we do have maybe 100 or 150 different colors or patterns at any given time. So if you know a, a movie star happens to be carrying a hot pink bottle down the street, we have to make sure we have that bottle in stock. Um, but the, the scale and the growth of, of an actual physical product and the tangible nature of making it and selling it with the, the doubling and the tripling that we've had is, has been incredibly challenging. So but it's been fun. You got to 100 million in two years? Yes. I'm sorry, you're asking the question. No, yeah. no, go ahead, chime in. Yeah. I mean, because that's you get 10 to 100 in, in years. 10 to 100 and not yeah. from zero to 100, but yeah. 10 to 100 in I, two I years, right? Good grief. The, the hard part about it is we grew so fast and we didn't really have the infrastructure to keep up with it. So, you know, the analogy that we, we've been using internally is we've been sort of painting the plane after we took off. So we mm. didn't have the people, the process, the system. So we did 100 million in sales and we were still in QuickBooks and duct tape and Excel. <laughs> so um, the first quarter of this year, Year, we launched an ERP system, we moved offices, we moved warehouses, we hired um, some more members of the executive team. So we really did the infrastructure work that we probably should have done at 50 million out of 100, wow. but we were just busy, busy selling, busy growing the business. And who are you going to for advice, either before this period mm -hmm. or during it, mm -hmm. uh, in order to, to know to do those things? Um, so I don't have an official board of directors or an advisory board, but I have more of an ad hoc um, group of uh, friends, I would say, entrepreneurs and um, there's people that I've sort of picked up along the way. Uh, Where do you find friends like these who can help you scale from 10 to 100 million in 24 months? You know, I'm lucky. So you, you, you mentioned I went to Harvard for business school. I've right. also been part of a couple really impactful women's programs. Um, I'm part of a women's program through Ernst & Young called EY Winning Women. Um, and I've met some great entrepreneurs there. Um, I've just sort of been lucky. I've been on, I'm on panels and just met people along the way. I've also found that if you just reach out to other entrepreneurs and just say, you know, I've, I've read your story, I'm in a similar situation, you know, let's share ideas. If we're not in competitive spaces, um, there's often times to idea exchange. And they point you to people who you should bring on board. Uh, great. Ben? Um, I just got off QuickBooks last year. <laughs> it's a great program. It's it nothing great. bad yeah, about it. It just it, there's a lot of tools that are missing. There's a lot of tools that are missing from an inventory yeah. planning perspective. So, yeah. yeah, right. so there's, there's ben, nothing bad anytime about Ben, anytime we call them, they'd be like, "We, we I, love yeah. you. We yeah. yeah. need to take this. We might need to move back. off right. somehow. Yeah. We'll catch up later. Yes. So, so take this back. Just you know, we'll bring the people in. You have scaled as well in this environment where people keep on saying that email is dead, that it's all happening on social media. Um, what's been your strategy? I mean, you don't have a physical product to keep an inventory, which I guess is, is great. What's been your strategy for growing the business and growing employees at the same time, and yet keeping the amount of control that you feel you need to? I don't know that I have so much a strategy. We just sort of have an internal mantra, and it's listen hard, change fast. That's pretty much all you need to know about scaling a business, I think. So the listen hard is going out and visiting customers as much as you can and what do they need. Uh, and then you've got to keep your business structured so that it can change really fast. What does a customer visit look like for you? Uh, it, it looks like uh, getting on a plane. Oh, well, first, it, you look through your database to find a, a clump of customers you can talk to. Uh, last what are you I looking for when was, you look uh, through the database? Somebody who's growing fast? You just somebody who's got... Boop. Okay, <laughs> Dayton, Ohio. Let me see how many I've got over there. Oh, 10? That's, that justifies a trip. You fly out and you go and you meet as many as you can and you just find out, hey, what does the MailChimp brand promise mean to you? What, what are we to you? And the last time I did that was in Dayton, Ohio, and they said, you're not email. You guys are all marketing. Please sprinkle the MailChimp magic pixie dust on all other channels. So that's why we've recently added more social channels even uh, to MailChimp. Um, is that not blasphemy when your name is MailChimp, not FaceChimp? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think if you get caught up in your own brand and you have your own perception, we talked a little bit about yeah. this backstage, it can seem like blasphemy. So the key is to get out there and visit your customers and ask them what does your brand mean to them. Mm -hmm. 
tell me about space, just physical space. Yes. If you are starting a business and you're determined to be really efficient, really conservative about it, one of the first big expenditures, I guess, that you're going to have to make is a place to put it. That's right. Either that or you're going to do it out of your home. Yeah. How, how did you plan, okay, now is the time to get more space versus whatever you're working out of? At, at what stage did you move out of the living room into an office space? My co-founder and I worked out of our apartments for the longest time, and it just drove us insane working yeah. at home. You get cabin fever. Uh, and so we had to go out. I, I just drove around town. I remember walking into one place, uh, and I realized I was in really out of my league. Like the lobby was all the way like 100 feet to the reception desk. <laughs> and I realized, oh my god, this is like type A office space. I can't afford this. <laughs> we eventually, we started in like a, a 10 by 10 executive suite. Yeah. That's all it takes. Yeah, it's same. So I started Swell in my apartment. And yeah. then when I, a couple years in, I had to find my first employee. I moved into a one person, we work month to month space, but it was a yeah. one person office, but I took out the desks and I put three little desks in there. <laughs> and then when we had more employees, and so we got the little office next door, and then we had more employees, we got the next office next door, and then, you know, you just do what you have to do. But the space doesn't have to be the hard thing. And, you know, there's lots of these month to month situations all over the world now. Do yeah. aesthetics matter? Or are there enough other places where you can hold your official meetings that you don't need to have a beautiful space that costs a bunch of money? We never had customers visiting because we serve yeah. small businesses globally, so right. they just went online. Uh, and uh, we were always scared to death that someone would show up. Because yeah. <laughs> like, like Sarah, we just sort of, uh, we were like cockroaches. We just hung on longer, yeah. and all of the other tenants would fold their businesses and leave, and we would just absorb their space. Yeah. And so our furniture was just really, really eclectic and weird. Yeah, I, I would agree. There's, there's plenty of beautiful places to have a, a nice meeting. Yeah. You can go, go, to the, go see the client or the yeah. customer or just do it in a hotel lobby. Do it in a, a really nice coffee shop. Yeah. I, I don't think that spending, yeah. if you're bootstrapped, if you're really thinking about where to spend, I wouldn't spend it on an a office. Yes, we are in the lunchtime break here at Iconic New York, but so much more to come in the afternoon lineup, and that includes a sit-down with, I would call her a cosmetics mogul, Bobby Brown, and doing that sit-down, that panel, is Kimberly Weissel, Inc.'s editor-at-large, joining us yes. now. Good afternoon. So pleased to be here. Well, we're very excited yeah. as well. And uh, let me ask you about Bobby Brown. Are you excited yeah. for that? I'm complete. Yes. I can't wait to speak with her. I spoke with her on the phone a little bit. I think she's going to be great. Yeah. So yeah. the no makeup makeup trend that she started. I mean, there was makeup before Bobby Brown. I have a ton of respect for someone who can take a field that we think we know everything about, do something new, and sell hundreds of millions of dollars of products. I want to know all about how she did it. Right. And that's kind of the, that's kind of what ink does, right? Abs you, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we look, it's a tired word, but we look for people who can disrupt an industry, right? Who can take something like Sarah Kaus, who was here earlier of Swell Water Bottles, we all had water bottles. We did. We didn't know we needed a forty-five dollar one until she came along, <laughs> right? Do we need? Do we need a forty-five dollar bottle? It's a hundred million dollar company, yeah. so <laughs> somebody does. And the smaller ones are twenty-five, and I have one. And I love it. Is that right. okay to say? That, so that's okay. That's yeah, okay. it is. It's kind of um, cool. And, and also makeup. There was makeup before Bobby Brown absolutely. came along. Absolutely, absolutely. And she was a freelance makeup stylist, right? Um, but she saw a need for something that was more natural looking maybe didn't send the message that you weren't good enough at how you are. Right. Built this company. She's left it now after 25 years, so it'll be great to see what's next for her. Okay, and what do you want to tell, what knowledge do you think the audience wants to hear from someone like, as established as Bobby is? Yeah. I mean, I think there are two things that people always want to hear about. One is, how do you keep your company culture as it grows? And two, how do you know when it's time to sell? And she had three offers before she actually took one, so I want to find out how she knew. Yeah, okay, well let's talk about Iconic here, Iconic yeah. New York, Midtown Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, you know you, we are, we're partners in this. Tell me, right. tell me what, what is it that we're doing here? You know, we are highlighting some of the most successful entrepreneurs and the people who advise them to try to help everyone in the audience build a smarter company to make better decisions day in and day out so they can have a strong company for the long haul. That's really what everything in Inc. is all about. And I think this um, joint venture between us, this conference really shows that. Yeah. 
tell me, what, what are the top, I guess, top advice that people ask you for all the time? Well, what people ask me for, is you probably get this too, is how to deal with the press. Right? That's what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Why? How would they do that? Uh, another big one is how do you talk about your funding and what kind of funding should you get? Because there's a lot of coverage around sort of the venture capital bubble. It's not right for every company. So people often need a little help thinking through if they have the kind of company that should get institutional financing or if there are other things that they should consider. Yeah, and yeah. lots of bright ideas floating around here. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. lots of innovation. Yeah. I saw water bottles that you can't knock off tables. Oh, I mean. well, do you have toddlers? So I got to try it. You do. I have to try it. Yeah, that's great. And I love that people come up with the ideas that you didn't know you needed, and then you saw it, and you're like, this is brilliant, I have to have one. That's what entrepreneurship is about, I right. think. Making the world a little better idea by idea by idea. I think it's really a fun thing to cover. Okay, so you're the editor in charge at Ake Magazine. I love that. I'm actually the editor at large, but you <laughs> can call her editor, editor in charge. In charge. That's um, good. So, when you're covering fast moving companies and yeah. fast growing companies yeah. like this, compare it to you know, other lines of finance that you've covered in the yeah. past. Uh, this is just way more fun. That's all there is to it, because the variety is astounding, both in the industries and the people who are trying to change them. And the entrepreneurs generally, they're doing this from the heart. They're not quite so on message as big company CEOs. So if you have a real question, they can very often give you a real answer. You know, they're proud of what they know and they're proud to share it. Um, we hear a lot of great war stories and it just makes it a really fun job. Right. And right. we hope it's instructive for other people who are trying to follow in their path. Yeah, we had a really interesting conversation and you did with, uh, with our producer yeah. just now because covering finance, you know, there is this line that you, you have to really toe. I mean, you have to cover the company fairly, but then you can't really border on encouragement. At Inc.com, you know, is there, is there such a line as well? Well, there is a line, but I think the difference is that we are supporters of entrepreneurship as a phenomenon, right? And we're not the only ones. I mean, this has, we've been covering this for more than 35 years, but more recently there's been a huge upsurge, especially among millennials and people who might otherwise retire or retire early, and policymakers about what entrepreneurship has to bring to our culture and to our economy. So we could be 100% behind that and want to see individual companies do well without being like, go buy this stock or right. go buy this product. You know, we don't have to worry about going there. Right, and yeah. Yeah, can you congratulate on earnings calls? They don't have earnings <laughs> calls yet. Once they have earnings calls, I'm probably not covering them, so I'm not congratulating anybody on those. Like, no, 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 we're not going back no. to that. No, thank you. No, it was fun, we're done. <laughs> Okay, so tell me, in all the years that you worked at Inc., um, you know, is there one company that stands out to you where you thought, wow, that was so inspirational. That was something that I really enjoyed covering. That was a company that I saw before everybody else. So I will tell you a company that I love that is not like huge, huge, huge yet. Uh, it's called Rock Paper Robot. They make what they call kinetic furniture. It's furniture that moves. It's furniture that responds. Um, so you know how scary that sounds? So <laughs> it sounds it sounds scary, but the woman uh, who's who has is running it has like the soul of an artist, and she got inspired when she saw a magic trick, and she's like, you know what? I know those things aren't floating, but we can make them look like they do. So she has a coffee table that the um, pieces of it look as though they're levitating, and it's a very effective optical illusion. So I love the idea of bringing beauty of using technology to bring beauty and surprise into right. things that we might think of as mundane. Yeah. So I'm hoping for huge things for her. Um, I just think they have some really creative pieces. Yeah, it's like installation art in your own Ex living room. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But, but not, there's a lot of tech behind it. Is it child friendly though? I mean, what about people with kids? Do they want a levitating coffee table? Well, it doesn't actually levitate. Okay. It just looks like it does. Um, no, I would say it's probably not for like your three and five year olds. Although some of the collapsing chairs definitely would entertain them for a long time. Okay. So it depends on which piece. All right. Yeah. Kimberly, thank you for dropping by. Thank you so much. And I much. look forward to your panel with Bobby Brown and just a bit. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that Kimberly just mentioned to us in our conversation was finding these companies who are reinventing an already established industry. I mean, there are examples of that in the marketplace and yep. you know Kate Rogers also found a company that reinvented the friendship bracelet take a look
Sarah Chips and Brooke Moreland yeah. want to change the way young girls think and play. I think that if we could start early and tell girls that they can be inventors and creators and builders, um, it's going to change the world. The co-founders of New York City-based JewelBot started selling their high-tech friendship bracelets in 2016. The bracelets pair with nearby friends, can send secret messages, and can be coded to change color. We uploaded the code to the jewel bot, and then it changed colors. When you're next to one of your friends, it like lights up. The idea was born out of an experience Chips had as a computer programmer surrounded by male colleagues. I was five years into my career before I worked with another woman, and it was another five years until I worked with another one, and so um, I really just always wanted to change that environment. The duo first launched their product on Kickstarter, meeting their $30,000 goal in one day. They graduated from Techstars in December 2015 and began retailing online on their own website and Target.com the following year, raising $1.3 million along the way. The hope is that more young girls will realize how fun coding can be. I think ultimately we don't want there to be a disparity between boys and girls in programming. We want just as many girls to program and get into the world of computer science and make that their career and design the products of the future. Okay, so later on this afternoon at Iconic New York, we're going to have a sit down with Damon John, founder of FUBU, also, of course, a shark in the shark tank. And in the past, we've had a few sharks visiting us at Iconic, including Robert Herjavik. I'm always a big believer in, you know, you can't change the past, but you have to acknowledge why you're here. And I'm sitting here because my dad, made an incredible sacrifice to get me here. He didn't have to, he made that choice. And so I always felt that if I didn't do something with my life, like I had this feeling of destiny. The problem was I had no skill and I didn't know how to add value. And, but I had this incredible sense of desperation that if I didn't do something with my life, all the sacrifice wasn't worth it. And I didn't want to be rich. I mean, not that I have anything against money. I know Kevin was here today, so you guys, <laughs> you guys heard all about the goodness of money. And don't get me wrong, I like money as much as the next business person. But for me, it was always about doing something with my life and achieving some level of greatness. But I just didn't know what or how. So it's interesting, you know, the problem with a lot of people who are very technical and you know, to this day, and, and being on Shark Tank has really helped me with this. You know, when you sell very complicated technology, there's a real art form in simplifying it. So today, you know, I'm, I've been in the computer security business now for over 30 years, and I'm very technical, and I know this stuff inside out, but most of the time, it's not what I talk about. I talk about the benefits and I talk about the value. And so many of my competitors really struggle with that. Mm -hmm. You know, they go in, they talk about the widgets and it goes faster. And so you've got to be very clear about what you, what you sell and how to break it down. It's the art of simplicity in technology. Interesting. One of the things I learned in my early 20s, because I, I think good entrepreneurs are, are great observers of people. Because at the end of the day, sales is really about human interaction. And as I watched my friends graduating school and getting fancy jobs, one of the things I learned and saw was that they were changing fields. So they were in hardware doing sales, like you know tools at Black & Decker. And then they would get a job in retail. And they were changing fields. And I noticed that people really want you to be great at a narrow subject matter. <laughs> Go back and talk about the calculus of leaving the Huffington Post, because it yes. does have your name on it. And that's the other piece of this, especially for serial entrepreneurs who build something. And it's, even though they sometimes have great ideas, uh, things they want to pursue, they think it's very, you know, my name's on the door, and if I leave and the thing fails, what does that say? They still think it says something about them. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it would have been very, very hard to leave if I had not built an amazing team, an amazing CEO, 
Uh, we have an amazing editor-in-chief in Lydia Paul Green who succeeded me. Uh, I think that was key, knowing somehow that I was leaving my baby in great hands, and it's turned out to be that way. And I really um, believe that after all, part of leadership is building great teams, and that's becoming increasingly important. And, uh, and I had spent a lot of time doing that. I had learned from my mistakes along okay, the so way. Okay, so biggest, biggest mistake in terms of choosing people, because that is, I think, one of the great challenges that everybody faces. How do you choose the right people? So I have this one rule, um, which I learned the hard way, which is no brilliant jerks allowed. No brilliant jerks allowed. Yes. What about, what about dumb jerks? No dumb jerks either, but the, that's easy. The no dumb jerks rule is easy. We all have it. The harder rule is no brilliant jerks. And often, you know, you come across people who are brilliant, who you know are going to be great, but you know they're going to be toxic for the culture. And I have an absolute rule, which is no, don't go there. And if you go there by mistake, fire them as fast as possible. And uh, the truth is there is nothing worse for a culture than quote unquote top performers who are um, really undermining their colleagues, who are creating an atmosphere where people can't be their best, they can't create, they can't build teams. So you said you learned the hard way. You don't have to name names, but, but tell us the story. <laughs> so really, um, there was a moment when I realized that someone who was um, really good at their job was incredibly toxic, where I had people coming up to me complaining about how undermined they were. Um, and it was a very hard decision because he was very good. So but she how do, was very good. How do you I'm not giving a pronoun. How do you identify that in advance? Meaning there's some people who are great at, you know, they're great at the interview. They're great at, I've, I've done it. I've, I've, I've made the mistake many a times. You, you, you have the job interview, they, they seem like the perfect person and Oftentimes, you know pretty soon whether you made the mistake. Yes. The mistake is, is usually relatively obvious. But in this case, was that obvious? Well, I'll tell you how you identified um, earlier. What I do now during interviews, I say, listen, I want to tell you there is something that I'm completely allergic to. I said, nobody likes it, but I'm completely allergic to it. And this is passive aggressive people. So I said, I give you complete permission. And this is at any level of the organization, because at the Huffington Post, where we ended up being about 900 people before I left, and at Thrive Global, where we are now 75 people, I interview everybody. So my, this is, a, this is a, a speech I give to everybody, which is, I give you full permission to walk into my office and scream at me if you're unhappy, if I did something you don't like. But I want you to consider this as your last warning if instead you go and complain about me or any of your colleagues behind their back. I want a completely transparent culture. If, if you're working with Andrew and you're upset with Andrew, I want you to go and talk with, to Andrew. If you want somebody to help mediate you, we have a team of people who can help and talk with you and Andrew. But I think the most toxic thing is I'm upset with Andrew, but instead of coming to you, I go to 10 people behind you and complain about Andrew. This is, this is the way to destroy a company very, very quickly. And so I, I give that speech at the beginning, and it does make a difference. You begin to you see how people react. Do you have a favorite job interview question? You know, I always want to know what do people want to do in five years. Because it, it shows you know, where their heart is. And do they see this job as a stepping stone? OK, so this one's hard. You have a very high profile. All right, so let's talk to Inc.com's president and editor-in-chief. But we are so happy to have with us now Eric Schoenberg. Nice to be here. Wow, so look at this. You know, hundreds of people here today in Midtown Manhattan. You know, did you think Iconic would turn into the success that it is? Oh, yes, I always knew it would. I, I mean, always. A combination of a couple of great brands in Inc. and CNBC, and a topic that is really important. Important to the people who come here and important to the economy. Entrepreneurship yeah. is the engine that drives innovation and job creation, and on the part of the entrepreneurs, creates self-fulfillment, and you know, a kind of 
feeling of accomplishment they just can't get anywhere else in business. Right. And so tell me about this, you know, the iconic events. How did you guys brainstorm and, and realize that people needed this? Well, Inc. was after a particular sponsor who wanted a uh, bigger scale than Inc. would provide all by itself. And Inc. had an events business. And we were thinking, who do we know who has a lot of scale? And I was thinking, well, I went through my list of friends. And those friends included Nick Diogan, uh -huh. uh, news director at CNBC, and Tyler Matheson, uh, of uh, the co-anchor of Power Lunch. And I thought, well, those guys have scale, and we have events, and they're interested in entrepreneurship, and we right. love entrepreneurs, and out of that, a happy marriage was made, and that sponsor is the sponsor you see all over here at the New <laughs> World Stadium. Really? Where? I couldn't <laughs> yeah. miss the signs. It's the iconic symbol, D-Mobile. That's right. Okay, so tell me about what you're hearing from the attendees at these iconic events, because I feel like it grows and grows each and every year. Well, a lot of people are repeat customers, which is a great thing. That's a really great endorsement. So people are coming up to me and saying, you remember me from you know, the iconic tour in Chicago or Seattle? And I go, yeah, sure, I remember <laughs> you. And they say, this is the best one of all. And I got on this many tips, or I did this amount of business, or I got to buttonhole you know, this famous entrepreneur and get their advice. So a lot of it is about you know, be getting up close and personal with your business heroes. A lot of it is about networking with other entrepreneurs. Some of it is about you know, buttonholing people like you or the Inc. entrepreneurs and being able to tell their story to a real live journalist. Right, and trying to get your attention as well. Maybe uh, yeah, get on CNBC or get a story in Inc. <laughs> now, okay, so basically here, is it the key is networking. Is that what they're looking for? Are they looking for investors as well? Yeah, they're looking for investors. They're looking for people who can give them tips about how to run their business. They're looking for vendors. They're looking for um, people who understand what they're going through. So mm -hmm. people that can just roll their eyes about over regulations, about taxes, about how hard it is to find good employees, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, do you feel that the entrepreneurial spirit, maybe it's all, it's been there, obviously, America's built on uh, entrepreneurship, but do you feel like it's scales in the last few years? It's really caught on. Oh, it's changed tremendously. When Inc. started, when some of the people who will be on stage, the real hero entrepreneurs, got started in their business, entrepreneurship meant the guy who set your house on fire and then sold you a hose. It was, they were, they were, it was, it, it meant you couldn't get a real job. That's what being an entrepreneur meant. And now, rightly so, belatedly, I would say, people recognize entrepreneurs as the heroes of the economy that they really are. Right. What do you think has changed at Silicon Valley, the dot-com boom? Uh, well, I think that's part of it. So people are getting rich, um, starting companies in a way they never could before technology really scaled things like that. Although people, of course, did, but it took longer. Um, but I also think there's just a recognition. Uh, the idea that entrepreneurs are job creators has acquired a lot of um, a lot of currency, I would say, in the past five to 10 years. And that's made a big difference. And people now recognize that this is where the rubber meets the road in a free enterprise economy. Right. Well, you're set to take the stage later on, Eric. You're speaking to Steve Handy of Brooklyn Brewery. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, typically when people come up to you at Iconic, what, what's some of the advice that they're, they usually ask you that they're looking for? Well, they're looking to tell me their story uh, and get it in ink. So that's one of the things. So, and every entrepreneur who's been around a while has a remarkable story. That's just kind of the nature of it. It's hard. Um, there's always some kind of near-death experience with your business where right. you, and there's always some kind of clever pivot that you make that helps you turn the corner. Um, and there's always a sense of accomplishment, a sense of mission fulfilled when you really do succeed. So the stories are pretty good. Advice that people are looking for, it's about where to get financing. That is a major roadblock for companies that are starting up. Um, and often it's also about people. That's the other thing that entrepreneurs tell us is the hardest thing in their business, finding the right employee for the right job. Right. And we spoke, spoke to Flywheel CEO Sarah O'Hagan yeah. earlier on. She's great. great advice. Right? Yeah, she's wonderful. Um, and one of the, I think the biggest piece of advice and the most poignant piece of advice I took away was you have to lean into failure. Yes. Don't be afraid to fail. There is, um, there's an academic study by a uh, a academic out of Stanford called Carol Dweck is her name. I don't know if you've, you've heard of her. And she distinguishes between two mindsets, the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. And the key distinction between these two ways of thinking 
or how you deal with failure. Fixed mindset sees failure as an indictment of you. Right. I am a failure, I can't do this, I guess I'm no good at this, I won't try again. The growth mindset says, all right, I failed, I'll try something different, I'll try it again. It's just a learning experience. You don't personalize it, you don't think it's permanent, right. and you don't think it pervades everything else in your life. And if you've got that mindset, you're halfway to being a successful entrepreneur. Well, you've been covering small business, entrepreneurialism for so many years. Is there one story out there that stands out to you? I was talking to Steve Hindi as part of our pre-conference, and he referred to, and he was a reader of Inc. when he was just getting started. And, you know, of course, now he's hundreds of millions of dollars business and everything like that. But when he was just getting started, he read Inc. And he referred to a story from way back then. I looked it up, 1987. The story was called Entrepreneurial Terror. All right, and what it refers to is what the writer described as that sense of terror that keeps you up at night when you're wondering how you're going to make payroll, when you are trying, when you're aware more than aware than anyone else about your failures as a leader and your weaknesses as a person, but you can't tell anybody. You can't tell your employees. You can't tell your investors. And you wonder how it's all going to come out and you don't know. That's entrepreneurial terror. And the one thing he says is that if you talk to other entrepreneurs and you ask them, how are the terrors? They might look at you at first like they, they've never heard that before, and then they'll get that glint of recognition in their eyes and they'll know exactly what you mean. Okay, so success driven by fear, ultimate fear. Fear of failure is a <laughs> real driver for entrepreneurs. Uh, one more question for you. Let's look to the future then. Uh -huh. Are there any trends that you see emerging? Yeah, there are. Uh, one of them is that the business of supporting entrepreneurs is becoming a very big business. So think about the companies that have grown up to make it easy for somebody to start a business. Kickstarter, Indiegogo on the funding side, Zendesk, LegalZoom, Stripe, companies like that that make it easier for you to do business by outsourcing or by giving you simple technology. So that's a trend. Right. Think about not just being a gold miner, but being a person who sells the shovels to the miners. Thank you, Eric, and I look forward to your session well, thank later you on today. Time. Yeah, so as you see, the New York startup scene is alive and well here. It certainly is. And Kate Rogers caught up with one of these movers and shakers. One of the biggest challenges for healthcare providers today is getting patients to actually take their medication. Adhere Tech is out to change that. We make patented smart pill bottles that track and improve medication adherence in real time. The bottles are loaded with state-of-the-art technology to tell when patients take the medication with sensors that measure the open and close of the bottle and additional sensors that measure the contents. If a dose is missed, the bottles light up and chime to remind patients to take their pills. The technology can also prompt reminder phone calls, text messages, or even activate doctor interventions. But you don't have to be tech savvy to use them. Our average user is 70 and about a third don't even own cell phones. Adhere Tech partners with pharma companies, pharmacies, and hospitals, including Dana Farber Cancer Institute and Wild Cornell Medical, to provide the smart bottles to patients for free, distributed from some of the largest pharmacies across the globe. They're being better at remembering, it puts them on a schedule. So patients have actually changed their behavior in response to having the bottle. To date, they've raised $2.4 million in funding from investors, including GE Ventures, and have thousands of bottles on the market in four continents streaming patient data back to providers in real time. What about people that don't have that vision, that they're not sure about which segment of the market that they're targeting? I think it's really important to have that brand vision because you, you can't go back and make it later on. You can't, you can't pull it back. You, can't, you have to at least start somewhere. So right. I, I think if your vision is to go mass, that, that's a very big market and that's important. But if, for me, I was trying to create a luxury brand without a budget and without a background in luxury. So the only thing I could do was think about the stores we were sold in and try to co-opt their, their messaging. That's amazing. And I think you were quoted once as saying that you were faking it till you made it. Yes. You made it now. <laughs> we made it. We made it. Thank you. Right. But it's to have that yeah. swagger, that confidence yeah. early on. Yeah, we, I definitely had to. Definitely had to. Yeah. And is that part of the advice that you would give to young entrepreneurs or those just starting out? You know, I would. But, but for me, I, w I was lucky that I really had a good network. So I realized there was a lot that I didn't know and I had to quickly get smart on. So my background was not in consumer products. So I had to find a lot of people to take out to lunch, take out to dinner, take out to coffee and say, 
I need to quickly understand how to do um, design or a website or product testing. And you know, there's some things that you can you can fake confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you can't fake a lot of other things. So I really did need to use my network and ask for advice. So I think the advice I would give to young people is use your network. People love to give advice. If you write to someone and say you are the expert in the world on X, Y, and Z, and I, you know, I'm in awe of what you've accomplished, and can I please just buy you a coffee? half the time someone's going to say yes, you know. So I would say really just reach out and just keep trying and just say, listen, I I really want to learn from you. You've done it. Help me. People will say yes. People and will then, help you. Uh, yeah. Well, what about taking the next steps to building a business? Because some people scale too quickly. Uh, they try to raise cash too quickly. You know, how do you know how to take, I guess, steps in stride? Yeah. For me, we I've had to say no. And saying no is hard. Either saying no to a partnership, saying no to an opportunity, um, because you can't scale too quickly. But if you do, then the whole thing can come down. So um, we grew incredibly fast. So last year we were the fastest growing women-owned business in the US. We've gotten a lot of attention. From that, we have a lot of incoming right now. That incoming is, is a blessing. In the past, we used to have to knock on doors and try to get it. So. It's, it's hard to pace it now. It's hard to say, this is interesting. Why don't we do that in 2018? Why don't we do that in 2019? Like, why don't we do it when we can execute on it in the style that we would feel proud of, not just hurry up and do it all at the same time. So for us, we really do have to pace it correctly. Um, we also grew so fast, we didn't have the proper infrastructure. So we were so bootstrapped that we didn't have the systems, we didn't have all the people, we didn't have the office space, we didn't have the warehousing. So the first quarter of this year, we have done all this unsexy stuff where <laughs> we move the people, we've moved the processes, we've moved the warehouse, we've really built the solid base of infrastructure so we can do that next level of growth. So sometimes, and, and that's not moving, you know, maybe the needle or the company forward, but you have to do that. So I would say to entrepreneurs, sometimes you kind of have to to either take a step back or just pause and breathe and say, what do we really need to do as a company to make it to the next level? You know, my, my, one of my business partners says, it's almost like painting the plane after you've taken off. You can't land the plane and say, okay, now I'm going to put a coat of paint on it. We are, we are flying, but we really do need to do those infrastructure improvements while we're going. But sometimes you really need to think about that. Okay, so what are your ambitions for Swell going forward? Oh, good question. <laughs> um, I really want to keep the culture. We have a family-like culture. We're 100 people in New York. We're two people in London. International is a big growth area for us right now. Um, but I want to make sure that the culture stays as we grow. So we're more of a family. We're not so structured, even though we have some structure that's coming, as I just mentioned. Um, but we have a lot of new products that are coming out. So it, on the innovation side, um, I want to keep the base. I want to keep our customers happy and excited about these new products. But I also don't want to become so corporate that um, but that it doesn't feel like swell when I walk in the door, that it doesn't feel fun and happy. But everything that we're doing really revolves around the function, the fashion, and the philanthropy that, you know, I think some companies as they grow, they see revenue opportunities and they just bolt on stuff and then they sort of lose their, their customer base. I don't want a customer, you were talking about how you have swells at home, I don't want you to walk into a store and say, well, swell sold out because now they're making things that don't make any sense. I want to make sure that it really keeps to the brand promises that we've made to our customers things that are beautiful, they work well, they give back to the world and the planet, and then they're made with heart. Yeah, absolutely, because you don't want your quality to go down. You want to keep it and maintain it where it is. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, just to talk to our entrepreneurs who are going through tough times, what do you think was your biggest challenge and how did you overcome it? Biggest challenge? We, I, every day. <laughs> every day is a really big challenge. You know, I think it's just, um, you know, keep keeping the energy levels up um, when those challenges do occur. I mean, we've what, what is the biggest, I mean, every, there's so many things that happen, but there, there's always a way through them. You know, the, the team is always looking to me and what am, what is my reaction going to be when this, this thing happens? You know, and I journal and I write about it and I think how am I going to see my way through it? How am I going to help the team through it? But I think it's always making those right decisions for the company and always making the making the call that we'd be really proud of regardless of the outcome. So, yeah. yeah. And let's end it on a positive note. The happiest moment so far being founder and CEO of Swell. Oh, the happiest moment. And most memorable. Most memorable moments. Yeah. Oh Where my. you would frame it and put it on the wall. Frame it and put it on the wall. Oh my goodness. I don't know. I think they're to come. I think they're really to come. You know, I, I, I have moments all the time. You know, I have moments where I'm on the subway and the person next to me pulls out a swell and I say, oh, I like your bottle. And they, they tell me about it. 
those moments, they're, they're so little. They're not, you know, I'm at the front of a magazine or they're not walking into a Starbucks and seeing a collaboration. Those are big moments. Those little moments where I know that there's somebody that's being hydrated or someone that knows about uh, the partnership that we have with UNICEF or something that literally is just sitting on the subway next to me. Those are the more moments I feel like I've made an impact on the world. All right. so, Sarah, yeah. thank you so much for making an impact for us at Iconic New York this year. Good to see you. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Right. Sarah there of Swell. Okay, so the lunch break here at Iconic New York is over, and that means the afternoon program is set to get underway. We have so much more coming up. That includes a conversation with cosmetics mogul Bobby Brown will take the stage. And then later on today, call it the crescendo of the program. We'll be speaking to what we're, who we're calling the people's shark of the shark tank. Founder of FUBU, Damon John, will be joining us. Now, a lot more peppered in in between as well. That includes, you know, a discussion on how to negotiate a deal. How do you become your best advocate? Also, we'll talk about thinking outside the box. That will be a very interesting panel as well. And also think about growing your brand. Think about going local instead of global, which a lot of people tend to do initially when they start building out their businesses. So there's so much more to discuss in the afternoon program here at Iconic New York taking place in Midtown Manhattan. And we'll bring all of that later on to you right here on our live streaming program as well. So don't forget to tune in to CNBC.com, Inc.com as well. well. We'll bring you also some of the guests that have taken the stage before or after their panel sessions. And we also have Facebook Live taking place as well on CNBC's Facebook page. So that's something also also for you to take notice of. And uh, we'll have a discussion with Bobby Brown later on this afternoon, our own CNBC Facebook discussion with Bobby Brown. I'll be hosting that, by the way. So I would like you to tune into it. But yes, we have so much more. So stay tuned. Don't click away and check in when you can. We'll see you later. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.